So the idea of the word in the context of Galatians 1 is that Jesus paid the ultimate price for our sins so that he might rescue us from our afflictions, our bondage, and from the hands of those who would do us harm. Ye must be born again, again, ye must be born again, again, I verily, verily say unto thee, ye must be born again, again. Good morning, and welcome to the Bible Study Pal podcast. I'm Greg Circle, the preacher for the Church of Christ that meets in Palmyra, Indiana. The goal of this public reading of this portion of Scripture is to spark thoughts for discussion in the midweek Bible study and prepare for the Book of the Month sermon series that goes through 2023. If you have any thoughts or questions that come to mind during the reading, type them in the comment section below. I verily, verily say unto thee, ye must be born again. Let's get into the reading. Welcome to Bible Study Pal for March 5th, 2023. The book of the month is Galatians, and the chapters of the week are 1 and 2. Episode 1, Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. The Purpose of the Letter In the Legacy Standard Bible we read, Paul, an apostle not sent from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. In this paragraph, Paul gives us the purpose for his letter to these churches in Galatia, and is found in verse 4, where he says, He wants the Galatian Christians to remember that, quote, Jesus gave himself for our sins, so that he might rescue us, unquote. And in the conclusion of the doctrinal section of this letter, we find why Jesus gave himself to rescue us. Quote, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Interestingly, when we get to the end of chapters 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, at the end of the month of March, we will notice that there is an alternative way to translate what Paul wrote here, and that's combining chapters 4 and chapter 5, which, if you'll remember from our discussions in earlier times, that the chapter divisions actually came much, much later than the New Testament was written, about 1227 A.D. But I want you to notice how it could be translated. If we read starting in chapter 4, verse 31, So then, brothers, we are not children of a servant woman, but with the freedom of the free woman, Christ set us free. And I want you to consider that and think about that as you go through Uh, your study with us of this book, as you go through your personal study of this letter, and as we go through it, and when we get there, again, we will talk about it a little bit more. But I want you to understand, and I I think Paul wants us to understand, and especially the Galatian Christians, he wanted them to understand that Jesus gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us. In today's episode, we are going to talk about just a couple of things. This is going to be more of a play-by-play episode of the podcast, and hopefully and hopefully, the next episode will be more color commentary, if you will. So in today's episode of the podcast, I want to focus on the words translated for, as in for our sins, and the word translated rescue. I think those are really important, especially when we consider what Paul is going to be saying, what Paul's going to be arguing in this letter. So first of all, let's talk about what the word translated for, the preposition for. What does it mean? First of all, the word is hooper. That's how I learned how to pronounce it or hyper. And hearing it as hyper, you recognize that we have brought in this preposition to our own language, English. Now, we don't bring it in as a preposition. We bring it in as a prefix. And indeed, that's how the Greeks used a lot of their prepositions. They didn't just use them as standalone words. They used them as prefixes to root words. And then we've taken that rule of their prepositions being prefixes and kind of applied it. Looking at the word hyper, you know, we think about people, kids especially, who are hyperactive. If someone is overly watchful, we might call them hyper vigilant. But in this case, when it's followed by a word in a certain form, it means something a little bit different. It doesn't mean over. Although there is a bit of that in this word, which we'll talk about in a second. The word means here 
on behalf of, or in place of, in exchange for, instead of. The idea is of a substitution that takes place for one reason or another. In Daniel Wallace's Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, he mentions that there are about 78 examples that he could find that do show that this idea of on behalf of, in place of, in exchange for, is in fact a proper way to translate, and especially when you get into the first century A.D. In a religious sense, or in a cultic sense, the word was used in the case of a priest basically signing a contract, or I guess it would be a, an individual or a family signing a contract with a priest to offer sacrifices on their behalf, in their place. As time went on, though, it seemed that this word came to be applied more and more to economical transactions. So we find contracts written from a little later than the first century that document a man agreeing to supply a clothier or a grocer with money in exchange for his wife's garments or his family's food. Huh. It's the first as a service model. Well, maybe not the first, but clothing as a service, groceries as a service. To me, I think the most interesting use of the word that Dr. Wallace brings up is when the word is used for contracts penned by the more literate for the less literate. And we still have this relationship today as well. Think about when you hire a lawyer, someone who is versed in contract law and all the ways that people exploit loopholes or perhaps even how to find loopholes. You hire him to draw up a contract or a will or some other important document in the clearest way possible so that there are no loopholes. Or perhaps you hire him to find you the loopholes. You hire him, you hire the lawyer, because you can't effectively and efficiently do it yourself. Yet the contract applies to whom? Does it apply to the lawyer? If he's not a party to the contract, then no, it does not. The lawyer wrote it for you. He wrote it as your substitute. He wrote it in your place. Turning to the scriptures, we do have an example outside of the discussion of salvation and Jesus' sacrifice for our sins, offering himself for our sins. But it is still in the scriptures. It's still a use of this word, hooper or hyper, and it still means not over in the sense that we might think, but Instead of, it does mean something of a substitution. If we turn to Philemon, we read in Philemon verses 10 through 13, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. I have sent him back to you in person, that is, sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. Here we read about Paul wanting Philemon's runaway slave, Onesimus, who fortuitously ran into Paul. He wanted Onesimus to minister to him in Philemon's absence, i.e., in Philemon's stead, instead of Philemon. So we see then that this idea of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ for us, that he put himself in our place, he wrote this contract we could not do ourselves, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. That's the idea that we read in this word, hooper or hyper. We read that Christ gave himself in exchange for, in place of, for our sins. And why did he do it? He did it so that he might rescue us. There's one word that translates, he might rescue. And we're going to ask, what does it mean here? The word occurs only in two other books of the New Testament, Matthew and Acts. And in Matthew, the, the context is kind of just the word itself. What does the word mean? What is the literal meaning of the word? It's plucking out. It's, it's not just choosing, but it's choosing and taking that choice out of the picture or out of the ground or out of some context. What Matthew does with this word is he takes it and applies it to when Jesus says in, for instance, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 29, and then again in 18 and verse 9, when Jesus talks about plucking out your offending eye, we bring in these two verses to show what the word literally means, that it's plucking out. Now, in, in the case of what Jesus says in Matthew, 
it's making a choice to remove something from you, something that is causing you trouble or will cause you trouble in the near future. Just keeping in mind that idea that it means literally to pluck out. Let's move on to how Luke uses the word in the book of Acts, because it's in these contexts that the meaning is more apropos. Luke uses this word to quote Stephen in Acts chapter 7 when he recounts the stories of Joseph and Moses. It's said that God rescued Joseph from his afflictions, verse 10, and he rescued the groaning Israelites from Egyptian bondage, verse 34. And in both of these instances, it's an example of God plucking out someone from, well, in in both cases, it's Egypt. It's Egyptian bondage and putting them in, well, in the case of Joseph, a place of authority, and in the case of the Israelites, a place of independence. We also read in Luke translating what Peter said when he was rescued, that the Lord sent his angel to rescue him from Herod, chapter 12, verse 11. Again, The idea, if we go back and read the story of how Peter is rescued, we see how that angel does almost literally pluck him out of that jail cell. He also quotes Claudius Lysias, the Roman soldier who, in a letter to Felix, as he is sending Paul to Felix, Claudius Lysias tells Felix that he rescued Paul, a Roman citizen, from the murderous conspiracy of the Jews, 23 and verse 27. And finally, when Paul recounts the Lord telling him, about his mission, his new mission. Paul recounts the Lord telling him that he would rescue Paul from the Jews and the Gentiles alike so that he might preach to them and turn them from darkness to light. Acts 26, verse 17. So the idea of the word in the context of Galatians 1 is that Jesus paid the ultimate price for our sins so that he might rescue us from our afflictions, our bondage, and from the hands of those who would do us harm. And again, as I said earlier, this is Paul telling us what he's going to tell us, or this is Paul telling the Galatian churches what he's going to tell them in this letter. And then in chapter 4, the end of the chapter and into chapter 5, he tells us what he told us in the letter. And those two ideas are very much related, that he came to pluck us out of our bondage, our afflictions, from the hands of those who would do us harm, and set us free. And so that's where I want to end up in today's episode. I want to just briefly talk about how Paul uses the story of Hagar and Sarah of Ishmael and Isaac to illustrate the point that he's going to make throughout this letter, that Jesus came to rescue us from being cast out of the home and sent away into the desert as Abraham did to Hagar and Ishmael. We could go back and read Genesis chapter 21 and see in 21 and verse 19 how God rescued them. But he does more for us than he did for Hagar and Ishmael. He does more for us than he will for those who will stay with Mount Sinai, the present Jerusalem. He adopts us into the spiritual family. We are no longer slaves, but sons. Children, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, we are set free. And it was for freedom that Christ has rescued us and set us free. Ye children of men, attend to the words so solemnly uttered by Jesus the Lord. And let not the message to you be in vain, ye must be born again. We invite you to join us as we worship our Lord and study His Word each Sunday morning at 9.15 a.m. for Bible classes for all ages, 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. for two distinct worship services, and each Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. for another chance to study and discuss God's Word. Occasionally, we may alter the p.m. service times for a special event. Please check palmyrachurchofchrist.org or our Facebook page for the schedule for the week. If you have any questions or would like to have a Bible study in person or by correspondence, email preacher at palmyrachurchofchrist.org or call 812-364-6215. I verily, verily say unto thee, ye must be born again. Thank you for listening.